Ford could come back at any time, couldn't he? He could come back tonight, in fact, before this meeting is over. And I hope and pray that all of you are ready to meet him. And if you're not, that tonight before we say the last amen, that you'll say, I am ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> all right. Are you happy? Everybody glad you're here? Rather be here than the best hospital in Cleveland, Ohio? Let me see. Some of you are so weak you can't even get your arm up. I'll declare, I think we'll just pronounce a eulogy on you. <laughs> Luke 6, 38. Now, I'm not going to preach from this scripture tonight, but I want you to memorize this. Have any of you tried to memorize it since Thursday night when we looked at it together? Anybody? Will you try to memorize it? Now, don't promise me. Promise the Lord. You need to memorize some of these scriptures. And this is one of the best, isn't it, Brother Wilson? This is the key, I believe, to faith promise. Let's look at it together and read it in unison. Will you do it? Here we go. Ready? Where is it found? Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you met with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now let's read that again one more time. Out loud. Everybody out loud. I mean, you're not afraid, are you? Let's really read it out in unison. You know what? Let me say this before we read this. This is why that I want us to read out loud. Uh, we have a little girl at our school, and she is just the, list, the most little clever girl. You know, it just seems like if you say, boo, that she'd jump clear over about 15 pews in the back. And I thought, that little girl is so timid. Is she ever going to get along in life? I changed my mind when I went to a school basketball game. I never saw such a big mouth on one little girl in all of my life, and a loud mouth. I mean, when, they, when our team scored a basket, she would yell, and you could hear it clear, I think, across town, you know. Now, I don't want you to do that tonight, but I want us to read it in unison and read it and where we can understand it. Ready? Where's it found? Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and taken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you met with all, it shall be measured to you again. Amen and amen. That's better. Now, do you believe that? I do. And I have taken that scripture literally. It works, folks. If, if you don't believe it, you try it and see. And God will bless you immeasurably. I think that's what that word means uh, there in the latter part of that verse. When, uh, when he says, uh, uh, and with the same measure, for with the same measure that you met with all, it shall be measured to you again. That's over and over and over and over, because you see, God's measuring stick is limitless, right? Or unlimited. You cannot limit it. You cannot measure it. It's unfathomable. Whatever that means, it's so deep it goes beyond the very depth of anything that we have in our imagination. So let's remember that. Now turn over a few more chapters to chapter 10. And I want to speak to you from chapter 10 tonight. And for the Gordon... I really appreciate that message this evening, the testimony or whatever, the presentation of the field. I really uh, praise God for that because that reminds me so much of when I was just recently uh, in Haiti, as I have told you, and then over to Puerto Rico. And there in Puerto Rico, before we came home on Saturday, we had just a little time of fellowship with a few of the missionaries there. They were around... Uh, how many? I think six missionaries and their families. And I was asking one of the missionaries, I said, what do you really need here in Puerto Rico? And uh, Brother Don Sidebottom that used to be in Ethiopia, and he's in Puerto Rico now, has a good work going already. And <clears throat> I thought maybe that he would say some kind of special need about maybe a, a, a vehicle or or maybe a building, or maybe to buy some property, or uh, maybe uh, a housing, or something of this nature. 
And you know what he said? He said, Brother Trammell, when you go back home, he said, tell them we need workers. He said, tell the people to pray for workers. We need workers. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now I could stop right there and I could say amen and uh, it would be sufficient. But I want to read on a few more verses because this describes the work of the Lord, these next few verses, so vividly, in detail, and we'll we'll discuss it then. Go your way there. He's talking about the ones he's calling out in the harvest field. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Tear neither purse nor scrimp nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house he, uh, remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house. And in the whatsoever city you eat, enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding. Be sure, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, but I send you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Let's bow our heads again for prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that thou wilt bless the message. We're so thankful, Father, for the beautiful music that we can sing from our hearts. Father, for the special songs that were sung tonight. God, I pray that thou wilt just use the words that Brother Wilkie has challenged our hearts with this evening. Such a need of the hour is for labor to be out there in the harvest field. Now, Father, may you honor thy word tonight as we have read it. And, Father, honor the message now. Anoint it with the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that all of us can say that right now, In this era, the age that we live, we probably have a greater opportunity of getting the gospel out than any time in human history. We have more things that we can use. Uh, We have the printed page, we have the radio, and we have television. And of course, we have the, the oldest of all of the ways that God has given unto us to get the gospel out, and that's by the word of mouth, just by telling each other. You know, this is what Jesus said. He said, I'll send you two by two before me into every city and place that I'm going to go. I'm going to send you there and uh, you tell them that I'm coming. And he said unto them, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Tonight, I think it's very obvious of that, is it not? The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. I don't know what the population is of the city of Cleveland, or I should say greater Cleveland, but I know what the population is in Cincinnati because that's my town. In greater Cincinnati, there are approximately one and a half million people, and all the churches that we have together in the city of Cincinnati, I kind of feel like Brother Gordon was feeling when he was talking about uh, the city there of uh, a million and a half people and the small amount of churches that they have. And I identified uh, right away with that because there are several gospel-preaching churches in Cincinnati, Ohio, and and one of them is the Landmark Baptist Temple, which is a a large church, and they have uh, other missions all around the town. 
but we have not even began to scratch the surface of Cincinnati. And sometimes I feel ashamed of myself that we're not getting a greater job done. When I gather together our staff meetings and talk to them, I tell them every time almost that we come together, fellas, here is the secret of building a church for God. Get people together that have a burden on their heart and send them out and win souls to Jesus Christ and bring them into God's house and baptize them and, and then send them on their way to one another. That's exactly how you build the church. And it's on the same way right here in Cleveland, Ohio and Cincinnati, Ohio. It's on the same way down in Brazil. That's what our missionaries do. Didn't you like that? When Brother Wilkie was talking about going out under this tree and starting that church, getting the people together and preaching to them and getting them saved and then going from there and starting a church and then you just keep on going from one place to another. Oh, listen, folks, that's what it's all about. And you know, Faith Promise Mission makes that possible. You've been in Faith Promise here in this church now for 12 years. And we've been in it for a couple of more years longer than you have. And I told you uh, one night this week about uh, the, uh, I think it was what, Wednesday night, I guess, about when we started. And boy, we thought we were really doing some great things when, when we doubled our missions giving and uh, it made uh, 10000 a year instead of 5000 And now we're doing uh, six times more than that. And I praise God for that. But even that, we're still not scratching the surface because there's such a great need. I think it's a crying shame that these missionaries have to be out on the field uh, for two years raising support to go to the foreign field and do the work of God. But I hope and pray that, that you will consider giving and remember what I've said also this week, that every person may not be able to go to the mission field. But we can all send somebody and we can all give that others might go. So I see all kinds of opportunities and all kinds of open doors here and and uh, as I was talking to you, uh, just uh, uh, concerning that, as you know, I find that uh, the best way to do that is to find labor, to find family. Uh, this morning, I was able to have uh, breakfast with our bus people and our bus staff and, and our church staff before coming back. And there must have been 25 or 30 people gathered out there together this morning. And I forget what the temperature was, I think 20 or 24 degrees, getting ready to go out and knock on doors today. And we had a, a prayer session together that uh, God would lead them to win souls to Christ. And we talked about what happened last Sunday. And uh, seven, I think, or 11, 12 souls were saved uh, last Sunday. And several were saved uh, on visitation on Saturday. And uh, the folks were, uh, were blessed of God this morning. And I saw tears running down the cheeks of men that are uh, much bigger than I am and of ladies with a broken heart. Oh, let me tell you something, folks. That's the way to get the job done. Get a burden on your heart for someone and claim that person for Jesus Christ. Realize that we can win them for the Lord. Uh, it takes families. It takes mothers and dads. It takes grandmas and grandpas and young people, boys and girls. It takes all of us to really do the job. I've heard people say, but Brother Trammell, uh, I've got a family to raise, and I just, I can't sacrifice, and I can't just put all that work into the Lord's work. Well, I've got to, well, you know, I think that the Lord knows more about it than we do, and He'll help us, and He'll take care of us, and, you know, uh, uh, I, I counsel a lot of people, a lot of young married couples getting ready to get married, and, and I told a uh, young couple the other day, they said, do you know of anybody that had an ideal marriage? And they were concerned about having an ideal marriage, you know. How do you have a perfect marriage? Any of you know? Any of you know how to have a perfect marriage? Do you, any of you have a perfect marriage? Now, don't raise your hands or don't, please don't respond. I'm just asking that question. You know, that's like, have, how many times have you asked somebody, well, come over and spend a night with us tonight. That's what we're doing in Kentucky, right? You go someplace, no matter where you go in Kentucky, you always say, come over and spend a night with us. Go home with us. How about going home with us? And while you had dropped your eyes, teeth, they said, okay, here I come. I'm going to come and go home. Oh, come over and eat with it. And, you know, if you take them up on it. But this couple said, uh, so that's why I asked the question, not the answer. This couple said, how can you have an ideal marriage? I said, well, there's only one couple in the whole, whole world that I knew that had an ideal marriage. And they said, please tell us who was it. I said, well, it's Adam and Eve. That goes back a few years, doesn't it? Adam and Eve, and, and so the, the young man, he bit like I thought he would. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, 
Adam didn't have to hear about all the men that she could have married. That's one thing. <laughs> and what about uh, Eve? Well, she didn't have to hear about the way his mother cooked all the time. So I said, that must have been the ideal marriage. And you know, the best way in the world to see uh, God bless and a church grow and souls being saved and missionaries uh, being called out from that church is to have people, families, I'm talking about real live bodies and real live families that are eager and willing to get in the work regardless of the sacrifice and do the work for God. But you know, today I find that there is a certain amount of apathy. Isn't that right? In our churches, I know there's some in Deer Park Baptist, there's some here. If there wasn't, then I don't know what your membership is, but if there was the right kind of attitude in our churches, our total membership would be out on any given night of a special service, wouldn't it? But, you know, they're going to have to ask the God for that. We do our part, and what, what our job is, is to try to get people concerned and fired up and motivated and burdened and get the job done. Now, here's the question. Why are the laborers few? Jesus said the laborers are few. The harvest is great. The laborers, where are they? Where are the laborers tonight? Oh, I've heard all kinds of excuses about mission conferences. I've used them myself. I, I hear, uh, you know, I've, I've heard folks say, well, it's just a missionary. <laughs> just a missionary. Just an old sinner saved by the grace of God. Just an old boy that loves his wife and kids. And they're willing to forsake all and leave America, go to the foreign field, stay there, raise their family send their kids to school, just a missionary. I'm afraid that most of us are not willing to do that. Amen. Most of us are not willing to surrender our lives to be a missionary, just a missionary. We need people that are concerned. We need people that will say, well, preacher, I may not be able to go, but I'll sure be willing to send somebody in my place. Because the laborers are few. Why are they few? Well, because of the nature of the work. Here it is in verse 3. Go your way. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Brother Ward, before God called me to preach, or when he called me to preach, I don't know if I knew that was in the Bible or not. I don't think I did. If I did, I must have realized it. Because it tells us, and this is all of us that's speaking about, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm not a fighter. <laughs> I, I just, I, you know, I'd run a mile to keep from fighting, but uh, I'm not, if somebody backs you up in the corner, I'm liable to do something different. But I, I just, uh, you know, I don't think any of us want to go out looking for a fight. Uh, but here, Jesus says to his disciples now, I'm going to send you forth as lambs among wolves. I don't know how many of you have ever been around lambs or sheep or little animals like that, but, you know, lambs are, they're very timid. They don't have much fight in them. One time, my wife, I'm telling you, she, she's nuts. I don't tell her I said that, but she likes all kinds of animals. Now, I know you, you folks don't do that. But sometime, one, one time, somebody asked Leah, said, would you like to have a, a little lamb if we brought you one? She says, well, sure, I'd like to have Oh, no, we don't need a lamb, you know. We've got some hound dogs, and we, and we had a couple of uh, chickens out behind the house, and here we are living in town, you know, and, <clears throat> and the, the preacher, and do you want a lamb? You sure, bring me a lamb. So we, we had some people that... Uh, lived on a farm down across the river, and sure enough, about this time of the year, it was still cold. Here they brought a little lamb. Uh, it, it was after midnight, in fact. Here they came in the driveway, just got back home, and knocked on the door. Went to the door, and here they had this little lamb. And uh, I, it was cute, you know. Tommy had a little lamb. <laughs> so they here, preacher. Oh, <laughs> now I said, Leah. Yeah. Get out of bed and get in here. She said, well, who is it? I said, it's your lamb. Well, tell her to come on in. I said, tell her to come on in here. So anyhow, she got out of bed and she came in there and, and uh, I had taken it and so I gave it to her. And so um, I said, now, what are you going to do this lamb? So they drove off. 
I said, I didn't think you were going to... He said, yeah. She said, I, I meant it. I said, what are you going to do with it? She said, we're going to raise it. We have it for a pet. And I said, well, you mean you're going to raise it. Not, not we. You are going to take care of it. It's your baby. So we go to bed. You know, it's about, it must be about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. And then about, well, anyhow, they brought a bottle to feed it, too. You know, he got a little lamp, got to have milk. Where are we going to get lambs to keep milk, or what do you call it? Well, maybe he'll drink cow's milk. We did have some of that. And uh, I said, what about baby form? Well, I think our baby was about <clears throat> two years old or so. She said, well, I'll take care of that. And so I said, okay, you take care of it. Well, we just got to sleep. <laughs> I punched. I said, get out. I said, take care of your baby. So here she, she goes in there. And, and I said, now, what's going to happen tomorrow night after she fed it the bottle? She said, well, it'll, it won't do that tomorrow night. The next night. We just got to bed and got to sleep. Man. And same thing. About two nights, I mean two times every night, instead of get up and go feed that crazy thing. I was so glad to get that thing big enough to get outside. And we found out that it was a, 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 a buck. That's a male lamb, that's a male sheep, a buck. And uh, what's a female? A female, I guess. Just a plain female. Anyhow, it, it was a buck. And we named it Bucky. And I mean it was a Bucky. And so finally she discovered that she probably made a mistake when she got that little lamb because it got mean enough and it started chasing her and wanting to buzz her all the time. You know, with his head and chased around the house one day and I came home from church and here she was setting up on top of the picnic table. She couldn't get down because Bucky had her treed up there and she couldn't get away. Ha! <laughs> I said, that'll learn you. You know what? It wasn't long after that somebody said... Uh, Leah, would you like to have a billy goat? <laughs> oh, no. We've had all kinds of animals because she likes those things. Well, here Jesus said, I'm going to send you forth as lambs among wolves. You know, it's sometimes not popular to stand on the Word of God. Sometimes it is not popular to sacrifice. And sometimes people where you work or people that know you, maybe your neighborhood, they look at you and they see you serving God all the time and they look at you and they say, I wonder if they're not a little bit off somewhere upset. It's not sometimes popular uh, with people. But let me tell you something. Jesus did not win a popularity contest, did he? In fact, he didn't come here to win a popularity contest. He came here upon this earth to die on Calvary, to die for us, and that we might go out and tell the gospel story in his place. So that's one of the reasons that the labors are few. Today, the reason that we have few soul winners is because people don't want to go out and knock on doors. That's hard work. You get out there and you start talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ and you get a few doors slammed in your face and you get your foot caught in the door and you walk around and, oh, that thing is so sore. I'll tell you something. That'll get your spiritual right quick. That'll get you in the Word. That'll cause you to learn how to pray more and have a, a greater burden heart. That'll cause you to be more concerned about the lost that are dying and going to hell. But here's another thing. Another reason that the labors are few is because of the faith involved. Look at number four. Carry neither purse nor strip, nor shoes. Salute no man, by the way. I mean, you're on the king's business. When you go work for God, you're down the business. Now, we can have a good time. I enjoy life, don't you? And I enjoy uh, joking and having a good time. But let me tell you something. We get down to business, don't we, in serving God. Nothing wrong with being humorous. Jesus was humorous himself. But there are times when we're very serious and we are times that it takes all the faith that we've got and then some. That's why the disciples called out for the Lord to give them more faith, teach them how to have more faith. Carry neither purse nor strip nor shoes. Salute no man, by the way. In other words, don't waste time. Don't waste time, and, and don't be concerned about this world's good. A lot of preachers I know, when God called them, and they sold everything they had and, and left and went to, bad, to uh, college. Some of the Baptist Bible College, other colleges around, missionaries the same way. You know, I, I believe that's what we ought to do. If God calls you, He certainly is going to be able to equip us and to take care of the needs that we have. In other words, what this is 
talking about is for us to be normal, is for us to not compromise, however. It takes faith, certainly, to sow the seed, and to, plow, uh, to plow the ground, rather, to sow the seed, and to fertilize it, to water it, and watch God give the increase. Another reason is because of the meager pay. That's why the laborers are few. You know, I, I know some preachers and I know some missionaries, and I'm not saying this to be facetious at all, but I know some men that could, could be making thousands of dollars in the business world, but they're not concerned about that. They're concerned about winning people to Jesus Christ. I don't know any missionaries who are getting rich. I don't know any pastors, for example, who are getting rich. Uh, if a man's been called of God, I'm talking about a man that's called of the Lord, he's not going to be concerned about the payday here. We're looking forward to getting payday one day in, in, the, in the heaven that God has prepared for us and the place that God has prepared for us. He says the laborer is worthy of his hire in verse 7. He said, don't, don't go from house to house. You know, you don't have to go around searching. <coughs> But God will take care of it. But did you know the pay is meager? I <clears throat> was telling Brother Ward a little bit earlier this evening. I was reading today <clears throat> where that out in Las Vegas we talk about money and that we talk about uh, tithing and giving to missions and supporting missionaries. You ought to read sometimes what happens how much money is spent, how much money is wasted, I should say, in the gambling world, in the vice world, in the drinking world, in society. We, we, you know, we talk about uh, economics. We talk about the waste of federal spending, which I believe there is still a great waste. The curbing is nowhere near what it ought to be. But did you know last year how much money was spent in Las Vegas, just one little city out of Nevada, where they have gambling casinos, and people I suppose from all over the world come there to gamble. They spent more than $1 billion. In fact, almost $1.5 billion. $1 billion, $423 million of dollars was spent on gambling. For the rookies think what we could do with some of that money. Some of those rich dudes would get saved and give their heart to Christ instead of just giving it to the devil and giving all that to the devil. But did you know what? God's still able to provide, isn't he? But to show you the way. And yet I'm afraid that sometimes that even we in churches, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to waste money. I, I, this is one thing I've prayed and asked God to help me as a pastor, that I would have the wisdom and he would show me and and uh, keep me in the place of where money is spent wisely and not to be wasteful. And, you know, I believe with all of my heart that you have a pastor here that's so prudent and so careful and so wise and in God, handling God's money and being sure that it's put in the right places. And I'll tell you something, friends. When you invest in missionaries through the Faith Promise Plan, that's one of the most wise investments that you can make in getting souls saved on not only on foreign fields, but right here also on our own soil. And then I think another reason that the labors are few because of the humility of the work. I'll tell you something, it takes humility to be a servant of God. It takes humility to be a missionary. Notice if you would, it says in verse 8, the latter part, it says, eat such things as are set before him. Missionary told me not too long ago that he was over in one of the islands in the South Pacific. And he said it was in a place where there were not many white people. And when you sat down to eat, you had to eat what they ate. And if you didn't, there'd be no chance of you winning those people. You see, that's just the custom. Like it is down in Brazil. When I was down there in Sao Paulo, I was Brother Ernie Johnson, the young man that you see, one of our missionaries there. He's in heaven now. The custom down there is that you drink that good old Brazilian coffee until it's running out your ears. Every time you go and make a visit, you've got to drink that coffee. I mean, if you don't do it, you hurt their feelings. And don't matter what kind of stomach, you may have ulcers or you may have 
it is every kind of stomach disorder. But if you don't participate in, and if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't uh, associate with them, you forget it. You wipe them off. Man, I'm telling you what, I got so sick. Woo. I never wanted to see a coffee bean the rest of my life when I was down there. I mean, there were some places we'd go in there, some of those, like he was talking about, Jack, and that lady boy, I mean, she just put herself out of the way. And they'd have that coffee all stashed back, and they'd, they'd boil it in tin cans. <laughs> Ooh, boy. But this missionary was telling me that they went in this village, and so they went in this hut, and said they were going to eat. And said they had no wash pan, they had no sanitary places. The sanitary place was over in the corner of the hut. You know what I mean? There was a ditch there that went outside. And he said they were cooking on the inside. And he said they were cooking some stuff that was real stringy looking. And he said, that almost turned my stomach. And he said, finally, it was finished, so they say. And he said that they put it in the pot. And they all reached in with their hands. And they take it like that and and said, you didn't dare chew it, you just swallowed it. You didn't dare ask what it was, you just pray that God would help you get it down and then keep it down after it got down. And he said, I tried. He said, I tried my best. But he said, I, I made the mistake of chewing it. And he said, I chewed it once and it got twice its size. And he said, I tried to swallow it and it wouldn't go down. And he said, I just had to make a lunge to the door and go outside and it, it all came up. But he said, I just pretended like that I had the coughing spell and I came back in and I tried it again until I, I kept it down. And as a result, he won that whole family to Christ. And you know, that's hard. Oh, listen, that would be a humbling experience, wouldn't it? I wouldn't dare tell you what that was, but not even privately. But it's a humbling experience. And I'll tell you something, we have to learn to be content. And then... The last thing, because of severity of the work. You know, God's work is a severe work. I have a list, and this is not even half, not even half of the list of people that is in heaven today. They were missionaries, some preachers. Doug Moore was a friend of mine that died in the plane crash in Alaska, missionary. All of these, in fact, are friends of mine. Lee Homer died in an accident over in Taiwan. Ed Scout, he's an independent Baptist missionary in Japan. His wife today is a mental casualty because she had a little boy that died there in Japan. And you see, the custom there in Japan was where they were now, and this is back two years ago that they would laugh and they would, their custom was different than Ed and his wife was used to. And as a result of this, it tore them up and she was unable to stay. Little boy, he told me several times about that little boy buried over there, but one day they'll meet together in heaven. Don Brown, that worked in the mission's office was a mental casualty. Art Sims was another one, but now he's gone back to the field, thank God. Anji Wicker was another one. He was in Korea, but of course he's pastoring now and doing a great job. I'm talking about these that had to come back from the field. Richard Conner from Ethiopia. Brother Gordon mentioned the missionaries that were killed by the Aka Indians. Jim Henry, one of my own boys from our church that had gone to Ethiopia and had to come back because of pressures and because of the cultural shock. He's in England now. Thank God for that. Another one of our boys that had gone down to Brazil he couldn't, he couldn't make it. Gordon, you, you remember them. Tharp, I think you remember them. Larry Tharp and his wife. He almost went crazy because not being able to take the mental shock, the cultural shock. Bob Hughes, a man that all of us have known, or most of us, went to the Philippines, and he died of cancer. 
Roger Keener, preacher friend of mine that died in the plane crash. Mrs. Bill Sears, a dear pastor friend of mine, his wife passed away. Chuck Baden, a good friend of mine that was formerly from the Athens Baptist Temple, he and his wife killed in the Lord's work. And then Ernie Johnson, a young man out of our church, one of my own sons in the ministry. In fact, he was my first one. Never will forget the time when his wife was expecting. It was her first child. His wife was saved at our church. And he had been saved when he came there. The doctor told him that they're going to have twins. Oh, they were so happy. I was happy with them. Ernie called me. He said, Preacher, doesn't look too good. He said, and one of them was stillborn. And they're not sure the other one's going to make it. And I said, Well, I'll be right there. So I went. And I tried to comfort him. And I went with Ernie out to the cemetery there at Rest Haven near our church. They prepared the grave near a big spruce pine tree. The wind was whistling through those pine needles. I never will forget that sound, nor that day. And me, and Ernie, and his mother and dad, and Barb's mother and dad stood there. Barb was still in the hospital. The other one was still alive. We all cried together, looking at that little white casket. I said, Ernie, there's one thing that I want to say to you. Never forget it. You may not understand it right now because you prayed so much for God to give you a son. Remember, you got one left, but even though this one was taken, God does not make a mistake. He said, yes, Pastor, I, I know that. So after we had the service and that, we left. And about four days later, he called me again and said, Preacher, the other one didn't make it either. So we had to make another trip out to the cemetery. Barb was able to go that time. There we were again, about the same group of people, except Barb was in, and we stood with our arms on each other. And I told him again, I said, Ernie and Barb, God does not make a mistake. You know, it wasn't but a few months after that, and we were in a mission conference there at church. And I heard somebody crying. And I looked over here to the left to where Ernie and Barb always sat. And they came forward with the invitation. And I met them down there and I said, what's wrong? He said, Christian, nothing's wrong. He said, we just learned that God does not make a mistake. And he said, we just realized that the Lord was trying to get our attention when he took our twins. And he said, we're surrendering to be missionaries. And we had a great time. And they, uh, they went on to Bible college, and they graduated, and I ordained him, and he had a church in Arkansas, and finally went on to Brazil, down to Recife, and then on down to Sao Paulo. And he called me all the way to Sao Paulo. He called me preach all the time. He said, preach? He said, it doesn't look good. He said, doctors say I've got cancer. He said, they say I've got to have an operation. And they offered it on him there. And I went down to visit with him after his operation. I forget how many doses of radium that he had to have, something like 55 treatments. I said, well, Ernie, remember what we talked about back years ago? And he said, yeah, preach. He said, I know God, don't make a mistake. But he said, I want to live, and I want to do God's work. And I said, I know. And he was doing a great work there. He had, the, had that work only a few months, and they're running already over 100 in Sunday school. And then we had a meeting while I was there. And uh, we had I don't know, several saves. And we had, a, I, I think it was about 130 on Sunday. And while I was there, I went down there to comfort him and to get him to take it easy. And, and every night we went someplace preaching. And we went to the city of E2. You know where that's out, out from Capitas? And we started to work out there and had a service out there. I don't know if it's still going or not, but he's just working all the time. And it wasn't long, about a year after that, a year and a half, he had to come home, had to have another operation. And the last time I talked to him was by telephone from his hospital bed. And the doctors had given him up. You know what he said to me? 
He said, God doesn't make a mistake. He said, if the Lord wants me, I'm ready to go. Just 32 years old, when God took him on to heaven. You see, folks, that's one of the reasons that the labors are few. This is severe work. This is why that we have missions conferences. This is why that we preach and we pray and we cry and we, we talk to you about a burdened heart to send missionaries. You know, we may not all be able to go, but we can send. Sometimes I'm afraid that we don't get involved because our hearts are not right with God. And tonight, if your heart isn't right with God or if you need to have God to increase your faith tonight, or maybe you want to surrender to the Lord to be a missionary or maybe to teach a Sunday school class or to sing in the choir or to drive a bus or to be a soul winner or whatever God leads you in. Every one of us can be a missionary. Then you ought to come tonight and make it known to God. Shall we stand with our heads bowed for prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we can spend together. We pray, Father, tonight that that will bless the service. Father, I pray you'll speak to hearts and lives. And if there's someone here tonight, Father, that needs to come forward and ask to have more faith and ask God to be used to be, maybe someone tonight needs to spend their life to be a missionary or a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, bus worker, father, soul winner, whatever. Father, I pray that that will be them in their hearts and lives. Oh, God, tonight, have your will and your way in each of our lives, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand in case number 303 in your song book.